This week's Bible readings will come from the book of Proverbs and Pastor Ian will be focusing on Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 but there are eight other separate verses we're going to be reading from so um, instead of flipping through your Bible back and forth there's a nice PowerPoint with the verses on the screen for you. So Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Proverbs chapter 2 verse 5 Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Proverbs 9.10 The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 7 Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Proverbs 19.21 Many are the plans in a man's heart but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Proverbs 21, verse 31. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. And lastly, Proverbs chapter 2, verse 16. It will save you also from the adulteress, from the wayward wife with her seductive words, who has left the partner of her youth, and ignored the covenant she made before God. This is the reading of God's holy word. I have done a PowerPoint this evening only because I've got some subheadings and I don't want you to get lost in all the, the subheadings that we've, we've got. Um, Proverbs is a wonderfully practical book. I don't think it is a particularly difficult book to understand. And some of, well, in fact, much of his wisdom you often hear quoted today in, secular, in the secular world, though people wouldn't know the source of what they are quoting. That's just the reality of it. So let's pray and ask for God's help. As we come before you this evening, our Lord and our God, we thank you for what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is your wisdom revealed. You may know yourself through our Lord Jesus Christ, and were it not for him, we would not know you as intimately as we are able to know you. We thank you for enabling us at this point in the history of the world to be born this side of the cross, for we have such greater understanding than those born the other side. And as we spend time understanding and trying to integrate your word into our lives, we want to plead with you this evening that this might not just be an exercise in gaining knowledge, but rather an encounter with the living God. We pray that you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, would take your word and burn it upon our hearts, that not only would it leave an indelible print on our hearts, but would be worked out in the application of how it affects us from day to day, that we might be living proof of the living word for Jesus' sake. Amen. There is a story of a male teacher who had back surgery over summer and began the school wearing a solid plastic cast around the upper part of his body. It fit under his shirt, and it was not visible or noticeable at all. On the first day of school, he found himself assigned to the toughest students in the school. Walking confidently into the rowdy classroom, he opened the window as wide as possible and then busied himself with desk work. When a strong breeze made his tie flap, he took the desk stapler in view of all the students, and stapled the tie to his chest. 
Needless to say, he had no discipline problems after that. When we think of fear, we often think in those terms, don't we? We think of fear in terms of being scared of something. We fearful to go to certain places, or maybe we have a fear, a acro, a acrophobia fear, fear of spiders, a fear of snakes, a fear of heights, a fear of dark alleys. I don't know what it might be, but we often think of fear in those terms, and yet the fear of the Lord is something different. I know when I was growing up, sometimes it was related to a kind of a deathly silence in a church, so that we had plucked in the front of our church this big sign that kind of said, when you enter this church, enter with reverence, and reverence was associated with quietness. Now, that is not to say that being quiet is not being reverent, but reverence is much more than just being quiet before the Lord. Reverence, or the fear of the Lord, is understanding how you and I relate to the Lord, understanding how great He is and how small we are, and then working out the fear of the Lord in our daily living. And it's so much greater than just being quiet before the God. It's certainly, there is an element of that. And the Proverbs gives us a number of different verses as he writes in helping us to understand what does this look like practically? How do we work this out in our lives? We hear a lot about the fear of the Lord, but what does it actually mean? And how does it affect me on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, firstly, the fear of the Lord requires knowledge. It almost sounds obvious. The fear of the Lord requires knowledge. Chapter 2, verse 5. Now, I've got all these verses out um, Chapter 2, verse 5, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find knowledge of God. Or, 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now, don't you find that interesting? Our world today would tell us that knowledge comes from learning facts and things about the world. The Bible says to us, true knowledge, real knowledge, comes from understanding who God is. And all knowledge is bound up in the Creator, and all knowledge stems from the Creator, and whatever knowledge you and I are given privilege into is a result of God's disclosure of such knowledge. It does not happen in a vacuum, but rather it happens in intimacy of relationship with God. Notice how the writer makes the point that the Lord gives knowledge and understanding. In other words, we don't acquire knowledge of God out of our own efforts, but rather it is God's self-disclosure, God's revelation, God's showing himself to us is how we gain knowledge. Now, there are two types of revelation. We're going to do a bit of systematic theology tonight. Two types of revelation. There's general revelation and there's special revelation. General revelation is God has revealed himself in nature. Romans chapter 1 deals with this in detail. So that when you look at the creation, you are meant to see that what stands behind this creation is a God who has brought it into being. And so we are told in Romans 1 that people turn their back on the creator. They deny the creator. They look at creation and they come up with all kinds of weird theories, evolution, and so on, to try and explain it, because they have to explain it. And in order to try and explain it, they come up with theories that remove God out of the picture, because the moment you acknowledge God, it means that you are accountable to a sovereign creator. That's general revelation. So the question I want you to think about is why is general revelation not enough to lead us to God? Well, the answer is quite simple. General revelation tells us there may be a creator, but it doesn't tell us whether that creator is good or bad. So if you're a bushman in South Africa, and you're out and you see or a, a, a Zulu warrior out in South Africa, and you see a lion kill a deer, you might think that's a very cruel God. Or if you're in a country where there's a massive earthquake, or like has happened in Turkey, and 
thousands of people die in that earthquake, you might look at that and say, well, if that's the kind of creator who created this world, then he's a very cruel God. Is that not what people do? They say that if God is a God of love, and why does God allow people to die in such unusual and horrible ways throughout the world, and God is blamed? So general revelation doesn't help us to get any further than that. So special revelation is necessary for us to understand who God is. And where do we find special revelation? Special revelation is bound up in the revelation of Jesus Christ. God's special revelation culminates in Jesus Christ. What does Jesus tell the disciples? He says when they say to us, show us the Father. And Jesus says, if you know me, you know the Father. Because I am God in the flesh. I am God's revelation to you. I am God's self-disclosure to you. I am God in the flesh. If you want to know God, then know me. Because as soon as you know me, you know God. And so in order for us to understand God, we need knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now what we need to understand within that framework is God hasn't given us every part of knowledge about himself. We don't know everything there is to know about God in spite of God's revelation in Jesus Christ. But what God has revealed to us in Jesus Christ is all that we need in order to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we are told in 2 Peter 1 verse 3, God has given us everything we need for life and for godliness. There are certain things about God you and I will not know, for we will never be omniscient. You will never have complete knowledge. That is an attribute solely possessed by God. But we do have enough knowledge in Christ to know who God is and to have a relationship with him. And so we have to then ask the question, well, where do we find knowledge about Jesus Christ? And the answer, again, is obvious. We find it in the revealed word of God. As we read the word of God, God by the power of the Spirit, illuminates our minds and helps us to understand who He is in Christ through the Word. Now, there are just no shortcuts. There just aren't. I know that it would be great if we could take the Bible and put it under our pillow at night and go to sleep at night and then hope that as we were sleeping at night that the facts of Scripture would just seep their way through the pillow and enter into our intercellular brain cells and become part of the knowledge that we have and we would wake up and we would suddenly know Ephesians off by heart. That would be great, wouldn't it? But it doesn't work like that. Knowledge of God requires hard work. It means that we need to be in the Word, and we need to read the Word, and we need to memorize the Word, and we need to wrestle in the Word, and we need to think through its application. It requires time in the Word. And if you read through Psalm 119 and go home and do it tonight, it's a long psalm. It's the longest psalm in the Bible, so it'll take you a bit of time. Maybe do one section at a time. It goes through the Hebrew alphabet. As we read through Psalm 19, what we discover is the psalmist helps us to understand the beauty of what we find in the Word of God, and his whole life is directed towards knowing God through the Word. Paul, when he writes to Timothy, makes this simple statement, all Scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, warning, and training us in all righteousness so the person of God might be built up. Or 2 Peter verse 1, 1 verse 3, that talks about the fact that Scripture, uh, the prophets who wrote were carried along by the Spirit of God so that what they wrote was exactly what God wanted them to write. That doesn't mean God dictated. It means that God so illuminated them that they came under the power of the Holy Spirit, that as they picked up their pens and began to write the Word of God, 
God ensured that what they wrote was what God wanted to be written in the Word. And so we have the Word about God. Now, I want to say one other thing or two other things about Revelation. Uh, this is a very systematic theology class. Revelation is progressive. Now, I'll explain that. What we mean by that is when we start off in the Old Testament, Revelation, as it unfolds, helps us to gain a clearer and clearer and clearer picture of God. If you only had Genesis, it would be very difficult to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. You would have to read it very carefully, and you would have to see how it's pointing us forward to Christ. But as that revelation progresses, so we get more and more knowledge of who God is, till finally it culminates in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Old Testament people struggled so much. And you living this side of the cross have so much more revelation of God. That's why Jesus says you will do greater things than these because you have greater knowledge. And even though he says John the Baptist was the least of all the prophets, even the least of one of these is greater than John the Baptist, not greater in terms of the, how God used John the Baptist, but greater in terms of the knowledge they have about Jesus. John died before Christ was crucified. You and I have knowledge of Christ crucified and raised from the dead. Greater knowledge than John. And in that sense, we stand in a greater privileged position than John because we have more knowledge than John. That's progressive revelation. Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2, let me read that to you, makes this, the author writes, In the past, hear carefully, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets and at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, now I want you to hear this last word because this is the last aspect of Revelation we're looking at. He has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. In other words, Revelation is complete. There is no further revelation from God in terms of the way in which Scripture has been revealed. The Bible is the final authority of God. Now, why is that important? Well, if you were here this morning, you would know that. Because if you were here this morning, you would have heard me talk about the uh, religions and Peter's, uh, Jesus' words to Peter about building his church. And the Catholics believe that the Pope when he sits in a chair and speaks ex cathedra, speaks with the same authority as Jesus Christ. So that they have the scriptures and the traditions of the church. So that when the Pope proclaims something ex cathedra, it is written down and is considered on par with scripture. And as Christians, we say, no, Jesus Christ is the final revelation of God. Revelation is closed in that sense. There is no more Bible to be revealed. It is complete. That means that you and I have everything we need to have in order to know God. And so can I encourage you, if you do not spend time in the Word of God, you are robbing yourself you are depriving yourself of knowing God. You are missing out on experiencing intimacy with Jesus Christ. You are short-circuiting yourself in your relationship and development of that relationship with God. Do you know why Christians get frustrated? Because they don't spend enough time nurturing their relationship with Jesus. The Apostle Paul when he writes to the Philippian church in chapter 3, verse 7, says, I want to know Christ. Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I, that I might be counted in him. I consider them rubbish. I want to know Christ. Paul spent his whole life determined to know Jesus. So let me make this practical. 
When last did you read through the Bible from start to finish? Have you ever read through the Bible from start to finish? Have you ever spent time setting out a timetable of Scripture? If you take, we're into February the 12th, so you're a little bit behind. You're about 120 chapters behind. But if you take three chapters a day, three chapters, you'll get through the whole of the Bible in a year. And if you get the Bible, that the 90-day the Bible, that you read through about 12 pages a day, you'll get through the Bible in three months. 90 days. So can I encourage you? Make it your goal. 2023. You're a bit behind the eight ball but you're not that far behind that you can't make up lost time to read through the Bible from Genesis through to Revelation so that you might know God. Secondly, the fear of the Lord requires trust. Requires trust. Chapter 3, verse 5 and verse 7. Let me read them again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. You all know the rest of the verse, don't you? In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. We all know Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I want to just take that first part in verse 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Notice how the writer speaks about trust in God's will with all of one's heart. What does that look like? So when we work that out, how do I trust God? Well, number one, it involves submission. It means that I bring my will into submission to the will of God. That I and God don't fight over things. That we don't argue over what He has revealed in His Word that I don't question the wisdom of his word, that I don't fight with him because secular society is screaming in my ear and saying, no, 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 that's old-fashioned. But I submit willingly, lovingly, joyfully, and enthusiastically to the will of God. This isn't a kind of reluctant, grit-my-teeth kind of, well, the Bible says I must submit, so I'm going to submit, and a kind of forced submission. This is voluntarily submitting to Christ. This is doing so with great joy in your heart. The point that is made by Solomon is that all of our plans are dependent upon God. And if we fear God, we will live in complete surrender to His infallible will. We will commit all our plans to Him recognizing that whatever plans you and I have are ultimately subject to God. You and I cannot do anything apart from the will of God. It's impossible. God is sovereign. In fact, we just did that in James last year. Let me remind you, James 4.13. Now listen to you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. We see that total trust and submission find its culmination in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus Christ spends time praying on his knees and finally saying, not my will, yours be done. That meant the cross. That meant suffering and agony and pain. But it was proof of the love that Jesus had for the Father and the love the Father had for Jesus. There was total agreement and there was complete submission of the second person of the Trinity to his Father's will. 
Do you submit to God's will like that? Do you argue about God, with God, about things that you think you should or shouldn't be doing? Are you willing to place yourself under the sovereign umbrella of God, which you are under anyway, and willingly accept whatever God determines? Or do we question and complain to God when things work out not the way that we had hoped or planned? Total surrender. Total submission. Trusting involves reliance. 2131. 2131. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with Yahweh. Victory rests with Yahweh. It relies upon him. A person can do everything possible to accomplish something. We can set all the plans in motion. But ultimately, even our ability to accomplish anything is dependent upon God's grace. You and I can do nothing apart from God. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. John 15. Verse 5. John 5, verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth. Listen to this. This is Jesus now. This is the Son of God. I tell you the truth. The Son can do nothing by Himself. He can only do what the Father, He sees His Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Jesus understood even that He was totally reliant upon uh, God the Father. And that whatever God the Father did, He did. And so you and I bring ourselves into submission to God. We say, Lord, we rely upon you. You are the one that strengthens us. You empower us. You enable us. You equip us. And you help us to accomplish all that you have set out to accomplish. And we participate in that. Now, this doesn't mean, I know here's the danger. This isn't the Keswick kind of convention that says, let go and let God. As if we just passively sit back and say, well, Since I can't do anything but by God's grace, then I may as well just sit back and let God do His work. No, no, no. We strive with all the energy we possess to serve God, to live according to God's commands as we depend upon His grace. Paul the Apostle gets this right. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10. Hear this. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace was to me was not without effect. Now listen. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying, I didn't just sit back. I went out and did my missionary work. He worked yet a job along with his missionary activity to supply income for him to be able to do his missionary work. And Paul says, I worked harder than all of them, but I recognized that my ability to do that was dependent upon the grace of God. Why should you and I be any different? We work at it with all our hearts as we look to God to empower us. Paul writes to the Philippian church in chapter 4, verse 13, and he says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. God's grace is what we rely upon. It's like these race car drivers. When they get into a car, that car is worked upon by the mechanics, it's prepared for them. They cannot race unless the work has been done. But the car doesn't race itself. They've got to get in there and they've got to push the accelerator and change the gears, hit the brake pedal in order for that to work. But they cannot do it without the mechanical backup they get in the pits. It's the same for you and I. We work, we get in the driver's seat, we drive the car called me, but as we drive that car, we rely upon that great mechanic to provide us the necessary tools to be able to do it. Without him, you can do nothing. Trusting invokes faith, 
29, 25. 29, 25. Fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. Faith is necessary in trusting in the Lord. Faith that looks to Him, not to man. Faith that relies upon Him and doesn't get distracted or taken off course because it's too scared of the opinions of others. You see, it's so easy in our Christian faith when we're in a situation where we're in the minority, and we are in Australia in the minority, and we seek to live out our Christian faith for the unbeliever to come alongside us and mock us and laugh at us and think that we're a little bit strange. I mean, why go to a church on a Sunday evening? Why give money to God, to a church? Why live according to the Christian ethic? Isn't that something that is only done by weird people? No, but we say God knows best and therefore we trust in Him and we will follow God's course laid out before us and we will follow the paths of righteousness and we will walk in God's ways, not the way of the world. And you can say what you like and you can do what you like and you can mock us as long as you like, but we will follow God because we trust in His word. That's faith. You can't do that on yourself. Faith must also be applied. It's no good saying, I believe in Christ, but not applying that faith. That's the difficult part of Christianity, isn't it? It's a difficult part of sermon preparation. Saying that our faith must be worked out. True faith, to be faith, is always applied faith. It's not good enough to say, I'm a Christian, but I'm sleeping with my girlfriend. It doesn't work like that. Because if God requires purity, then those who are faithful to God and who trust God and exercise faith in His wisdom will keep themselves pure until they are married. And they won't listen to the voices of the world. They won't hear it when they're told, well, living together is kind of a trial. It's faith applied. Remember the priests in Joshua 3 verse 13? Remember as they faced this great big raging Jordan River in flood? And God said to them, I want you to cross. God only moved the water when they got their feet wet. They had to step into the water before God would stop it. Faith must be applied. And we trust God that He knows what's best for us. That His wisdom is far above the world's wisdom. And when God says, for example, and I've spoken about this before, but let me remind you, that there are only two genders, male and female, then we accept that. We reject transgenderism. We reject any identity that tries to promote itself as other than male or female. Because God created man and he created woman. And that's the end of the story. And we trust him that he knows that that's right. Faith applied. Do you really trust God? Do you trust Him with your finances when you come to that time when you get paid? Do you trust God enough to say, Lord, my first priority is to give some money to you and to your work, and then I'll work out how I use the rest of my money? What about when it comes to our sexual ethics? Are we willing to stay away from pornography? Young men, young women, Are we willing to realize that that kind of stuff is going to pollute our minds and pollute our relationship with Christ? Do we trust Him enough to say, Lord, I know that's not good for me. I'm going to submit to you. Do we trust Him enough to provide work for us when we're unemployed or underemployed? Do we step out in faith and say, Lord, I don't know how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. You promise to provide all of my needs according to your glorious riches in Jesus Christ. Do we trust Him when we get older? 
and our health begins to fail, that even in our gray hair, even in our old age, he has promised to sustain us, to keep us in the palm of his hand, and not to allow us to experience that which we cannot under his grace bear up under. Do we trust him? Do we trust him in the romantic side of our lives? Lord, I desire to get married. Do we trust that God knows whether it's right or wrong for us to get married? Are we willing to relinquish that part of our lives to him and say, Lord, you know what's best? Do we trust him with our future? Say, Lord, I don't know how life is going to work out. I don't know where I'm going to be, but if you take me and you send me onto the mission field, if you call me to be a pastor, then, Lord, I'm prepared to give up my secular work and I'm prepared to hear your voice and go. Will we go? Will we trust him to provide in those circumstances? That's faith. And then finally, the fear of the Lord results in wisdom. True wisdom must come from God. The beginning point of wisdom is from God. All wisdom comes from Him. He is the source of all wisdom. It must begin with a belief in God. That's the beginning point. That's where it starts. Proverbs 14 verse 1. Let me read this to you. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There was no one who does good. And Hebrews chapter, and I can't remember the chapter, I think it's chapter 11, says without faith it is impossible, chapter 11 verse 1, it is impossible to please God for anyone who uh, comes to him must believe in him. In other words, faith is, in God, in the existence of God, in the reality of who God is, is necessary if you and I are to become wise. You cannot have the kind of wisdom that God is prepared to share with uh, people until you have come to faith in God. That doesn't mean you can't have a measure of wisdom. That doesn't mean that everyone outside of, of God is unable to make decisions that are good or, or, or uh, <clears throat> that are wise decisions. What it does mean is that there's a whole body of wisdom that they are missing out on that is given to Christians by God. It is important to realize that God gives wisdom to those who humble themselves, those who are not proud, those who don't think that they know it all. Isn't it horrible when you come up against someone who knows it all? I had that experience. I was warned about it. When we went uh, to the uh, snow fields in Perisher. Was it Perisher? It was Perisher, wasn't it? And uh, we stayed with a particular couple. And we were warned by another couple in the church that this particular lady, that uh, wife of the guy we were staying with, knew everything. And she did. You name the subject, she was an expert on it. Don't you hate people like that? Now, God says, remain humble. You know, it's going to sound scary to some of you who are younger, but the longer I've been a Christian and the more time I've spent in Scripture, and I spend a lot of time in Scripture, hours every week, the less I've realized I know. There's so much I don't know. There's so much God has yet to reveal. I've just got a tiny piece of knowledge. Proverbs, or 1 Peter 5, verse 5. Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those older. All of you, all of you, clothe yourself with humility towards one another. Why? Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Do you want to really get knowledge? Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and He will lift you up. I sometimes say to people, aren't you proud of your humility? Because some people try and put on as though they're humble, when they're not really. Those who are truly humble don't know it. 
I read an interesting story. Some of you may have heard this. You may know this about Samuel Morse. Do you know who Samuel Morse is? Morse code? Some of you who are older know what Morse code is, right? Samuel Morse was the inventor of Morse code. Anyway, it tells a story of, uh, he was asked if he ever encountered situations where he did not know what to do. Morse responded, more than once. And whenever I could not see my way clearly, I knelt down and prayed to God for light and understanding. I bet you didn't know that. Morse received many honors from his invention of the telegraph, but felt undeserving. And I quote, I've made a valuable application of electricity, not because I was superior to other men, but solely because God, who meant it for mankind, must reveal it to someone, and he was pleased to reveal it to me. It's incredible humility. And that's the starting point if you really want to be wise. And then finally, true wisdom comes, may confound logic. Now, it doesn't always, don't misunderstand. God normally works within the conventions of traditional wisdom and common sense, which is so absent today. And God works within that framework. But sometimes God's wisdom is different to the wisdom of the world. And sometimes because it's so different to the wisdom of the world, the world doesn't understand it. And you must remember and you must be sympathetic to the world. Because the world are plunged in darkness. They're under the umbrella of Satan. And he has darkened their mind. So there's a level at which they will never and cannot understand until God shines the light of revelation into their minds. And so we have to realize that sometimes the world are going to do stupid things. Because they can't help but do stupid things. Because of the darkness. And Satan is the greatest deceiver of all. He took two innocent people who were not tainted by sin when God created them. And he managed to get under their skin. And he managed to bring the, the, the wisdom of God into question by saying to them, did God really say? And you have two people untainted by sin at that point and yet bought into the deception. And Satan has been see, deceiving mankind ever since. So we've got to understand, don't condemn the poor unbeliever out there who thinks they're 62 pronouns. They don't know any better. They don't have God's revelation. And sometimes the revelation of God is foolishness to the world. Don't take my word for it. Let me read One Corinthians one twenty. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? All these people who philosophize about self identity of whether you're a male, or female, or nothing, or an in between, or some other version. One Corinthians two six, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. One Corinthians three nineteen, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight, as it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness. You see, what man evaluates as wise and what they think is clever. God laughs at it and says it's foolish. And you and I, unfortunately, are sometimes going to be branded as foolish by the world because we don't subscribe to their wisdom. Can you imagine what the people of Jericho thought when the Israelites started marching around? They must have looked over their walls and looked at this mass of people marching around their city and saying, what are they up to? What are they doing? I mean, it's not as if our walls are going to fall down. 
That's exactly what happened. God did something that was totally out of the ordinary. And because you and I are people of the word, and because we stand upon the foundation of the word, and because the word is all that we have that guides us in life, the world is going to look at you sometimes and say, you're mad. You're foolish. But rest in the fact that God's wisdom is wiser than the wisest person in the world. And stand on it. Take confidence in it. You will find conflict when you choose to follow God's wisdom. The world will shout and scream at you. They will say, what's wrong with getting drunk? We're just having a bit of fun. And God says, do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. But instead, be filled with the Spirit. The world will say to you, lying is okay. It, if you tell a little bit of a lie here and there, it's not going to hurt anyone. God says, do not lie. Be truth tellers. The world will say to you, a little bit of juicy gossiping, well, you know, there's no harm in that. I mean, they, 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 they're not present. The Bible says, do not gossip. The world may express itself sometimes in anger and rage. The Bible says, do not get angry. The world may like and seek to take revenge when they've been hurt. How many movies have been made about revenge? The Bible says, it is mine to avenge. I will repay. Romans chapter 14. The world says, we determine what ethics are. We determine what's right and wrong. And ethics becomes a matter of subjectivity. If it's good, it's right. And God says if it's good, it's not necessarily right. It can be bad. Our ethics derive from the word of God. And we follow him. And let the world laugh and let them mock. And let them think that we're a little bit weird. But in the end, when we finally get to meet God face to face, we will be able to do so with absolute confidence. For Jesus will welcome us into his presence. Don't live for the approval of the world in the here and the now. You heard, James, your life is like a mist. It really is. If you're young here this evening, just speak to some of us older people. Your life is like a mist. It goes so very quickly. It really does. One day when I'm dead and you're in your 70s, you're going to say, you know, I remember Pastor Ian, that old weird guy. You know, he said that life goes quickly. Here I am, I'm 70. How'd it get you so fast? If God spares you that long or if Christ doesn't come. But eternity, you're there forever. Let me ask you, what matters? Hearing the world pat you on the back or hearing God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your inheritance. Live for Jesus and him alone. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. Help us to learn to work out the fear of the Lord in all these ways. And may Jesus be our war cry from start to finish. May he alone be the one we follow religiously, scrupulously, in total surrender, in commitment to him for as long as you give us breath in this world. Help us not to turn to the left or to the right, but to follow the voice that says, this is the way, walk you in it. Strengthen us to that end, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen.